Okay, let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy 18. Uh, that'll be one of the places we're looking at today. Deuteronomy 18. And today's title is Extispacy Omens. Uh, that's not extra spicy. That is how I like my food, but... Um, and there's a funny little graphic in there. I don't know what that is, but extispacy omens, how does God speak to us? Uh, so we're going to talk today about another area of idolatry that the ancient Near Eastern world had, and we're going to try to understand how we, in the 21st century uh, of the year of our Lord, still fall into those same kinds of idols. So uh, kind of the premise of these last couple of weeks has been looking at the idolatry that Israel fell into and thinking about, uh, you know, do, do we have those same problems in our lives? Because we do. Although we don't worship Zeus and we don't worship Baal and we don't worship Ishtar, we still have the same human hearts that want to worship that which is not ultimate, and want to control, like we saw that last week, we want to control the deities. And again, we're going to see this week a kind of element of control. Uh, so, we're, uh, I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 to you, and uh, then talk a little bit about the ancient Near Eastern background behind uh, this verse. Moses says here, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer. Uh, so within this text is this prohibition to not do what the nations around Israel would do. And the nations around Israel would do things like making their sons or daughter pass through fire. Uh, that was the god Molech, and they would sacrifice children to that god. Uh, there's debate whether or not that literally happened or not, but uh, I really think they probably did. Uh, we have throughout history seen uh, people sacrificing children, even to this day, we sacrifice children in the name of freedom and autonomy. Uh, but so God is saying, don't do that practice. Uh, don't practice witchcraft, soothsaying. You know, that, that's a really hard word to define. As you look it up, it's used in many different places. And uh, it's, again, just the idea of looking toward the future, speaking for the gods, things like that. And then what we're going to look at today is one who interprets omens, and then lastly, a sorcerer. Okay. So this idea of interpreting omens, uh, what is an omen? An omen is some event that happens in the world that gives you insight into something that's coming in the future. Right? So we don't use this much anymore if you're watching some movie about, you know, perhaps medieval times, they'll talk about, oh, that's a bad omen, you know. Uh, and the belief was that the gods would do things that had an effect on the material world that would give you insight into what was coming. Uh, so this says, don't interpret omens. So today we're going to talk about one of those practices of how people in this ancient Near Eastern world interpreted omens and what that means for us today. Uh, I have a passage here in Ezekiel that kind of will give us some clues into some of the ways uh, people interpreted omens. Uh, let's go, uh, if you'd like, you can turn to Ezekiel 21, 21, and then we'll be back in Deuteronomy 18, so you might want to leave a finger there. But uh, can we advance the slide? Ezekiel 21, 21 says this. This is talking about the king of Babylon and what he does. Ezekiel 21, 21. For the king of Babylon stands at the parting of a road, at the fork of two roads, 
to use divination. Divination is another word we're going to mention a lot. Divination, uh, when you divine the future, it means you determine the future by means of the gods talking to you. So divination. Uh, all right. So he uses div divination, and here's the divination he uses. He shakes the arrows, he consults the images, he looks at the liver. So it's verses like this that are uh, having me go through school right now, paying the big bucks to figure out what in the world is this talking about, right? Shaking arrows, looking at images, looking at a liver. What in the world is this talking about? Well, these are three ways of divination that we find in the ancient Near Eastern world. Uh, the shaking of arrows was called bellomancy. Okay? You've heard of necromancy, consulting the dead. Bellomancy is consulting the arrows. All right? It's kind of like they play pickup sticks. You ever play that where you shake the sticks in a can and then dump them out? And however the arrows are pointing, you know, there's different ways of predicting the future because you believe the gods would give you omens through the tossing of these arrows. So, you know, however they come out, you know, if there's one on top of here, one pointing this way and one this way, it means this is going to happen or this is going to happen. So this was how they determined, and this is sometimes how they made major decisions. Okay? Uh, we do the same thing today. <laughs> flip a coin. It's like, yeah, you know, who cares? We'll flip a coin. Well, back then their belief was that gods are invested in this and they will make this happen. Uh, so bellomancy, the shaking of arrows. Uh, the other thing it says is that he consults the images. That's the word teraphim. Uh, you've seen that throughout scripture, like in the, um, the story when uh, Jacob is leaving with uh, Rachel, and Rachel sits and stole all her dad's household gods. Do you remember that? And she's sitting on her donkey, and uh, and the dad, Laban, is mad, and he comes looking for them, and she's hiding them under her on the donkey, and she says, I can't get up right now, and he's, you know, it's, I'm a woman, that kind of thing. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, never mind, don't get up. And she was hiding the uh, idols under there. These were little household idols that could be this big, even. Uh, we know this from, I was just reading the other day, D remember when David, like, escaped, oh, what was the story? And his wife sets up, it's one of these household idols in bed and puts like hair on it so that they come in and think David's lying there. Uh, you know, so these idols could be like this big, uh, you know. And, and, and so the idea of consulting images is asking these idols for things. And then the last thing it says is looking at liver. All right. I don't know about you, but if you had to look at liver to determine the future, I would never do that. I hate liver and onions, you know, it just, it's not a good meal. Uh, but here's uh, where extispacy omens comes into play. Extispacy omens are the examination of liver, all right? Uh, that's called the exta. And you are looking at the liver, trying to figure out the future, all right? So it would involve... Ezekiel 21 shows us these different ways. Uh, and it involved a priest called a baru examining the organs of an animal to determine the future. All right. Now here's what they would do. We, we have actually discovered in archaeology these omens. And there's vast collections of them. Uh, and before you even examine the omen, you would have this whole ritual performed before you killed the animal so that you could co coerce the gods into answering you. Okay. So I believe I have pictures next. Put them on here. I think my clicker just died. It's not lighting up anymore. Oh, there we go. Uh, so here is an extispacy omen. This is the kind of stuff we have dug up from the ancient Near Eastern world. And if you look at this, you see a bunch of little holes all over the place, right? Uh, now, also, there's writing that you probably can't really see. And these are little wedged writings. This is called the style of writing cuneiform. Uh, you know, I'm actually learning this right now, studying two different languages written in that, Akkadian and Ugaritic. 
Uh, they're both vastly different languages, but use the same system where you have this kind of pointy triangular thing and you push it in the clay to make these letters. So these holes have all this writing around them. And as you have this liver, what you do is you take an animal, you sacrifice it, you cut it open, and you pull out its liver. And you hold up the liver and you look and see if there's different spots or abnormal things on uh, these different spots in these different areas. And then you go over to your uh, kind of pre-made graph and you see what it says about the future. So if there's a, you know, a dot, a, a spot on the liver in the upper right-hand corner, you read that little Acadian there and you say, okay, this means bad years are coming to the kingdom. Or you, you see a spot in the lower left-hand corner and you see, oh, that means that uh, the king is going to marry three more wives from this country, you know. So uh, we have just stacks of these that we have discovered in uh, just all over the world, in fact, uh, but mostly in the ancient Near Eastern world. This is an extispacy omen that has Akkadian writing on it, and in theory I should be able to read this at some point, but I'm not, actually not going to study that much Akkadian to be able to read that tiny print on there. So uh, here is an extispacy omen, uh, go to the next slide, uh, that is another liver. This is Etruscan. Do you know who the Etruscans were? They were Italians before the Romans. Uh, so the Etruscans are more ancient than Rome. So there's Etruscan writing all over this. And I don't know Etruscan, have never studied it, don't know much about it. It's an Indo-European language. So again, you just look at the certain part of the liver and you can determine the future at what you're look, uh, 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 of, uh, through looking at this liver. And so the king of Babylon did this, and in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10, God says, you're not going to do that. This is not how you're going to communicate with me. Okay? You know, number one, you do this ritual and that God must answer you. Number two, you pay a ton of money to do this, right? Think of the cost of an animal. What we find in the ancient Near Eastern world is that pretty much the only people that ever did this were kings. There are a few instances where uh, just a, a you know, private extispacy omen ceremony happened, but for the most part, kings were the only ones that could afford this. So who has access to the gods? Well, just the king, because he's the only one that can afford to cut open a bunch of animals to figure out the future. Right? Uh, hopefully they at least ate the animal in the process. I, I think they did, but that's all part of it. Uh, so God, back in Deuteronomy 18, says, I don't want you doing this kind of thing. So let's go to Deuteronomy 18 and figure out what is at the heart of this. Why doesn't God want to be asked uh, by means of liver omens? Why does God not want to be uh, addressed in that manner? Is it just because God doesn't like liver? You know? uh, now, th there's also extispacy omens with sheep lungs. We have a bunch of uh, lung extispacy omens. Uh, so, uh, why does God care about this? Well, back in Deuteronomy 18, uh, let's Go to the next slide, Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 shows the context, uh, is in the context of laws talking about the king. Deuteronomy 18 is written within the context of laws talking about the king. Uh, so in chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, uh, we had laws about the king going on. But then in verses 18, or sorry, chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, we have laws about the priest going on. And then in verses 17 to 22, we have laws about the prophet. Now these are the three major leaders within Israel, prophet, priest, and king. So the context of what we're looking at is uh, the prophets, the priests, and the kings. This is the leadership of Israel who is to help preserve them as the people of God. Uh, so Ezra, can you click that next slide? Uh, so 
This is in the context of talking about prophet, priest, and king. Advance it again. Israel was to live differently from the nations around them. Uh, look at verses 9 to 14. This is the fuller context of the verse we read. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, that's our ecstasy omens, or a sorcerer, verse 11, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord, your God, drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess listened to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. So God wants them to live differently. He doesn't want them coming to him uh, just in the same way that the world does. God has always been about producing a people who live differently from the world that has fallen away from him. God is all about creating a new people. And he's doing that same thing within the church. That's why we, as the church of God, need to live differently from the world. We need to be the kind of people that try to discern our lives and what's going on in life in a way different from the world. You know, when I think about the way the world does life, uh, some people are very driven in their goals, and they set a goal, and they stomp on anyone who gets in their way. You know, that's a worldly way of discerning your future. You know, some people uh, just live life completely distracted and don't have any goals, and just go on in life and all the events of life just kind of carry them along as if there's some current in a stream. And God doesn't want us living like that either. Okay? God wants us to live in a way different from the world so that we discern the future in a way that's different and so that we call upon God in a different way from the world. Okay? Uh, so I hope you could see a quick and easy application is you know, you really shouldn't consult things like astrology, uh, you, you know, the, the planets and how they align, uh, the year you were born. That This all kind of fits into this kind of thing. Magic eight ball, you know, the dumb thing, you shake it and you know, sh try again. You know, uh, uh, you know. uh, and really, that's what people were doing with this bellomancy, with the consulting of arrows and with the with the opening up of livers, it's like, God, speak to me, you know, tell me. And God says, you know what, I'm not your magic eight ball. And unfortunately, we treat God like that at times. It's like, all right, uh, we go to him in prayer. I want this to happen, Lord. What should I do? <laughs> oh, ask again. Oh, okay. I got to keep praying. <laughs> ask again. Oh, yeah. Not right now. Oh, okay. All right, I've waited five days, Lord. Can I have what I've asked for in prayer now? Signs all point to yes. Oh, phew, good. You know. That's not what our Lord is. And we treat him like that at times. And we think, oh, we're, we're, we're way better. I, I don't cut an animal open and consult the livers. But we do when we pray in such a way that is just always looking for God to communicate to us in our timing and on our terms. You know, that's what I... As I use this to put a lens on my heart, I see that there are times when I don't like God's timing and I don't like the way I hear from God. I want God to answer me in a more distinct way, and I want God to answer me in my time. You know, in the longer I go, I've known the Lord for you know almost 40 years now. I've been walking with Him, and in that amount of time. What I've learned, I haven't learned it and put it into practice, I've seen it over and over, is that God moves a lot slower than I would. He really does. Um, and then at times he moves at this breakneck speed that I can't handle. But God's timing is not my timing. And I can fall into the same sin as these weird guys who cut open livers and shake the arrows and have household gods. God doesn't want us living that way. 
look at verse 22 now. Uh, verse 22 says, well, actually, let me go to verse, uh, what do I want to do? Go to verse 17 of chapter 18. The Lord said to me, this is Moses talking again, uh, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth. So God's saying, this is how I will talk to you. The way I'll talk to you is I will put my words in the mouth of a prophet. I will give you my word. All right. Uh, so I'll put my words in the mouth of a prophet. He shall uh, speak to them all that I have commanded him. This is kind of setting the stage for the rest of God's word. God is saying, this is the only way I will communicate to you. I will set aside people to communicate, and I will give them the exact words. You know, at times we call this the process of inspiration, right? Verse 18, And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But, okay, sounds great, so... What's going to stop someone from just coming and saying, hey, the word of the Lord came to me. You owe me 20 bucks. You know, uh, I, I kind of do that thing with my kids at times. But no, God's saying, you don't get to just come and declare this is the word of the Lord. Verse 20, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall I know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously and shall not be afraid of him. So Israel is to live differently. They're to follow someone who speaks the words of the Lord that God puts in their mouths. Uh, but here's the problem. The problem with false prophets is that they speak presumptuously for the Lord. Uh, so let's put that next slide up, because I don't know about you, but I need spell check to help me spell presumptuously. So the problem with false prophets is they speak presumptuously for the Lord. They assume uh, that, hey, God gave me this message and I'm telling you this message. Now, this is warning us, it is a grave sin to claim you are speaking on God's behalf when you are not. It is a grave sin to claim you are speaking on God's behalf when you are not. That's why James says, let not many of you presume to be teachers. Peter says, when you speak, speak of as of the oracles of God. So those who would teach God's word, God holds you to a high standard. He says, you're speaking on my behalf. You know, be careful what you are doing. Uh, you know, that also needs to be you and giving advice to your friend and just speaking so authoritatively. Well, you must do this, thus and so. You know, uh, I I've watched the history of fundamentalism at times has been a history of taking a verse and whacking someone over the head in it to make them do what you want them to do. God says, don't speak presumptuously that way. Uh, so go to the next slide. It's a grave sin to claim that you are speaking on God's behalf when you are not. All right, let's go to Numbers chapter 23. And you can advance to that slide as well. Numbers 23. And here's a story. I don't know uh, until, let's see, a couple days ago. When did I start working on a paper? Uh, it was the beginning of last week. I wasn't aware of this, but Numbers 23, you probably know the story of Balaam, the false prophet who was riding on a donkey, and the donkey saw an angel of the Lord, and the donkey stopped, and Balaam got all mad at him, started kicking him, and the donkey looks up at him and says, hey, what you doing? I'm your donkey. You know, There's an angel there about to kill you if you continue on. And Balaam's like, oh, sorry, didn't see it. Yeah, because you're not paying attention to the Lord. Because you're seeking the Lord on your own terms. You're trying to ask the Lord for things that he is not going to grant you. And you're demanding things of the Lord that he didn't promise. That's the key with this Balaam, false prophet. Well, who Balaam was, was he was a prophet, uh, a prophet in the ancient Near Eastern world that was working for a king who was an enemy of Israel, Balak. Uh, 
so Balak hired Balaam, and that's the thing you find with all this prophecy and all these omens and these diviners. It's all a money racket, right? It's just this way to make money, but Balak had hired Balaam to curse Israel, to, to really kind of call the wrath of God down upon that nation, because Balak was terrified of them, because they had this great uh, reputation now as they were entering the promised land. So Balaam is hired to curse Israel because he's known as a guy who has an insight into the gods. Well, he tries to do it three times, and he just finds himself not able to do it. So in the very least, he's at least in tuned with God and what God is influencing him in. Now, not to his credit, what he, he's doing is actually, he, he's very much into the spiritual world. So he knows what the voice of God is like, as opposed to the voice of demons, as opposed to the voice of anything. And he recognizes when God will not let him say what he wants to say. So in chapter 23, we have this. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar, seven altars. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stand by your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height. Uh, you always go to the heights to worship gods in the ancient Near Eastern world. Uh, that's where sacrifices have, were done. Remember last week, where did Elijah have that showdown with all the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? Uh, so he's going to a high place, uh, and he, the altars are prepared. So verse 5, Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. How did God say he was going to give Israel the word of God back in Deuteronomy 18? By putting the words in prophets' mouths. How did Balaam try to get God's word? Through sacrificing a bunch of animals. But we'll say in a moment, what's that about? Okay. Uh, so the Lord puts a word in Balaam's mouth, verse 6. So he returned to him, and there he was, standing by his burnt offering, and he and all the princes of Moab... And he took up this oracle, meaning he spoke the words that God put in his mouth. Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? From the top of the rocks I see him, from the hills I behold him, there a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you've blessed them. So he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak the words the Lord has put in my mouth? So here's what's going on here. Uh, go to the next slide. Balaam demands the seven oxen and seven rams to be sacrificed. What would they be doing with all those animals? I wonder, a diviner. This, the purpose of these animals, next slide, was for the purpose of examining their livers, the extispacy omens. That's what he's doing. But, next slide, instead of God speaking through the animal organs, he speaks directly through Balaam. That's what verses uh, 7, and then again in verse 18, God makes him speak again. Then he took up this oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, listen to me, son of Zippor. Uh, you, know, you, you notice these were burnt offerings, uh, and Balak was lighting them. Well, the lighting of an altar was done by the son of Zippor, and from that day forward we have what were called Zipper lighters. That's not real. Okay. Uh, God is not a man that he should lie, unlike your pastor. Uh, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed. I cannot reverse it. 
He has not observed of iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel, nor uh, the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of the king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. Now these are all words that Balaam is saying that God had put in his mouth. Okay, But verse 23, here's the key. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. That word divination is the word that we have seen pop up in all these texts. And that word divination is our word we learned earlier. It's this extispacy omen. So God is saying through the mouth of Balaam, who sacrificed all these animals, what was the point of sacrificing them? So he could cut them open, look at their livers, and figure out a way to curse Israel. And God's saying, guess what? You sacrifice seven rams, seven oxen for nothing. You sacrifice these uh, so that I would speak to you through them, but I'm not going to do that. Because I talk to you on my terms. Uh, so that's what's going on in this passage. Uh, Balaam is uh, the kind of diviner who uses extispacy open, omens to talk to the gods. Uh, so go to the next slide. What we see here is that God uh, will denies that any divination will occur. That's what he expresses here in verse 23. So how does this expose modern idolatry? Because we don't cut livers or cut animals open to look at their livers to figure out the future. Here's what I find in the text that I find crop up in my own heart. Uh, here's the modern idolatry. Go to the next slide, Ezra. This is demanding God communicates to us in ways that we want. That's the modern idolatry we find here. Demanding that God communicate to us in the ways that we want. Now that could be a number of ways. That could be, on the, like I said before, the timing. We want God to make it known to us now. Why is this happening now in this area in this time? Why? You know. And so we struggle with that. And we want to know that immediately. But sometimes God doesn't give the answer. Sometimes it comes in the form of wanting to hear a literal voice of God. Wanting God to speak like he used to do. Like, God, didn't you say you would speak through a prophet? Well, as you read the rest of the Bible, you find out that God would speak through prophets, but then he would have those prophets write out what they spoke, and then those writings are the word that God is speaking to people. This is the process of inscripturation. And all scripture is inspired, is the mouthpiece of God. So the way God speaks to us now is through his word. He doesn't possess some person to say the exact words of what you ought to do. Like, today I'm going to be driving to Washington, D.C. Should I take Route 15 or should I go over here? What should I do? You know, well, I will listen to the voice of my phone. Uh, you, you know, I can't expect that God will just... Give someone a word of prophecy to tell me, go down this way, because if you go this way, you're going to hit traffic. You know, uh, If you do that after the service, I will probably go the opposite way that you tell me, because uh, I just don't believe that that's how things work nowadays. But anyway, let's talk about some application. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, first, God's primary means of communication is through his written word. That's how God communicates nowadays. That is what is useful in our lives. We all think, oh, it just wouldn't it be nice if God just talked to us the way you and I talk to each other so that I could hear him? Well, God does talk to us, and the way he does it is through his word, and we need to pay attention to what his word says. Uh, now, I think I listed the verse incorrectly here. It's 2 Timothy, not 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration, that means breath of God, the mouth of God, and is profitable. So it works. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So did you catch that? What tells me what I need to know to how to live and what to do in life? Is it some voice speaking through someone? Is it some prophecy that I get? Uh, we were in our Ithaca Pastors Fellowship, and some guy came one week, and uh, we asked, you know, hey, who are you? How's it going? And 
uh, you know, I talked to him a little bit before, and he said, oh, I've moved to Ithaca to, you know, preach. And I said, okay, I'll we exchange phone numbers. And then, then he was given time to talk, and, and no one knew what he was going to say. And then he, he just starts going on and on about how the Lord told him that there's all these nations around Israel doing this and that, and you just have to study this. And, you know, the Lord is going to return in so many years, and God has told him to come to Ithaca to tell everyone this. And uh, so then afterwards, he came up to my friend at uh, uh, East Shore Christian Fellowship and said, so would you like to get together? And my friend said, no. <laughs> and he, he looked at me and said, well, we exchanged numbers with you. I said, I, I don't think uh, I am interested in anything that you're going to tell me. I'm sorry, no. And he, he, he hasn't been to any meeting since then, but God communicates through his written word. That's enough. That is what we need. We don't study that enough. Why would God give us any more? It's right here. That is what is profitable. And you say, well, where do you get the word written from? All scripture. The word scripture doesn't just mean Bible. Scripture in Greek literally meant the writings. So the writings left behind by those who received the word of God, those writings are what we need for living life. That is how God communicated with us. And if that's not good enough for us, then we're falling into that same trap of seeking omens from livers. You know, we need to study God's word, not look for omens throughout life. Okay? So scripture means the writings, not the spoken word even. Uh, next slide. The written word of God is as sure as a voice from heaven. I love this verse because it just kind of helps me realize when I think, God, just say it out loud. It'd be a lot easier. It'd be a lot easier than me having to pray, wait on you, see how things play out, read the Bible. It'd be a lot easier if I could just ask you something and you would say something to me. Listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter 1, uh, 18 to 21. Uh, Peter says this, And we heard his voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. This is Peter, remember? He saw Jesus transfigured, and he heard God say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Okay. So Peter's saying, I witnessed that. I heard the voice of God from heaven. Few people can claim that. Okay. Peter is able to claim that. But what does he say about that? Verse 19, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Those are all messianic terms. Knowing this first, that the prophecy of writings, the scripture, is, a, is not of any private interpretation. So it's not just privately handled to, handed to someone. It's this public thing that God has done through the, the prophets and through the local church that he has given the word of God to his people in broad daylight through the writings. And what does Peter say about this? Knowing this, that no prophecy... Uh, I'm sorry, back up. Um, here it comes. Um, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Peter is saying, we look at these writings. We have this sure word that it is, it is just as sure as the voice of God I heard from heaven. Uh, so as we look to those writings, we hear God's voice. Right. So the next slides. Although uh, we may want to hear the voice of God new, we need to give attention to the word that he has already given. And then, uh, next slide. Those who claim to speak a word of God to you should be afraid of speaking presumptuously for God. I have many brothers and sisters in the charismatic movement whom I love and who love the Lord, but the trouble is some of them desire to have God speak to them in these new and exciting ways. They they, they want a fresh word from God. And, and when you say you want a fresh word from God, does that mean that this word is stale? Does that mean that this word is ineffective? Does that mean that this word is not to be studied? Does that mean you've already read it all? I, I've read it all through a number of times, but boy, I, I haven't heard it all. <laughs> right? uh, I've read it through a lot, but 
I don't know everything and how it applies to every way of life. There's a lot of work to be done still looking at this word. So let's go after the revealed word of God written down in the scriptures for us. That is how God speaks to us today. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you have spoken to us in this time. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would seek after it and not seek new revelation when we have a sufficient revelation, a word that is as sure as uh, you speaking from heaven during the time of transfiguration. Pray, Lord, that we would glorify you in everything we do. In Jesus' name. All right, since we don't have a piano, we're going to uh, forego our last song. And uh, 